Now the idea today um, is that I can answer some questions if, uh, if there are some um, or I can show the software that we are using and are creating at the moment still. Uh, hi, hey, happy to have you there. And um, well, I'm not sure uh, how to start here. I am, <laughs> uh, this is the first time we're, I'm doing this in this way. So maybe you can also just tell me if you have a question. Otherwise I can start talking a little bit about EEG analysis. Okay, maybe we'll uh, we'll just uh, do it like this. Uh, I will show you the device that we are using for the Intuitive XR Suite and for also for the Skyrim mod and the software. And um, I can show you a little bit about what EEG should look like, and um, and then you can maybe ask some questions if you have any. So this is the Muse device. That's the stuff that we're using um, in the in our uh, research in this case and like no, that's not a medical grade EEG device that's just um, a very uh, rather cheap um, consumer uh, end user device but it works surprisingly well and um, it's flexible so you can you can uh, squeeze it and so on and so it's, it's quite smooth on the head that's what it's made for it's actually for people to sleep with it and then it should track your sleep stages it should also help you meditate uh, this kind of stuff um, but we are abusing the device a little bit and use it for uh, for human computer interaction so um, let me actually start sharing my screen so that I can show you the software. Okay. Oh, so first of all, if you if you want to get the software, it's all free. Um, this is now in endless mirror. No, this is what I wanted. So um, if you if you want to get the software. Um, it's all downloadable, downloadable here on the IXR Suite website, um, Thunder Labs um, repository, and then the IXR Suite. The, the repository is uh, hosted on uh, the Thunder Labs repository, but it's completely uh, GPL3 open source. So, so that's great also for research or if you um, want to contribute at some point. Um, that's also uh, going to stay open source. Um, okay, and then if you are there, you can see the release page there um, where you can get the current version of the IXR suite. If you um, start that or if you uh, download that, then you get this one here. You could disregard the lab recorder for now, but uh, the IXR suite is, is the thing that, you, that, that we use for just um, fetching the data first. And if we start that, um, then we also need to switch on the Muse. Oh yeah, if you start that the first time, you get uh, an insecure provider or unknown publisher here, and that's me. <laughs> so if you trust me, you can run it. Um, then we, uh, we have the Muse. If I switch it on here on this side, then it starts to run the lights back and forth like this. And... Um, the IXR suite takes a while to, to boot, 
because it, uh, it, it needs to load all the background files, all the uh, libraries, and it's not extremely well, um, well optimized, but it works. And um, you can disregard these settings for now. If you have a Muse like this, um, then you can stay, uh, you, you can leave the board ID at 39. If you have different devices, then you can use a separate board ID as you uh, can see here if you mouse uh, ho uh, hover uh, over the board ID. So now if I connect, I get the Muse, uh, I, I get the, the, the device here. And now you can see that all the channels are white because there is no signal coming. So I have to take it on now. interesting so as you can see now the the middle two channels they seem to be okay although the 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 tp9 and tp tp10 these two channels seem to be very bad which makes sense because they are under my headphones so quite likely they have a very high uh, line noise uh, contribution if but i must say actually they are not that bad so you can still see my eye blinks here. If I blink my eyes, um, they are, uh, you can see the eye artifact uh, and so on. But uh, at the moment, at the time the channels are white, they are not used for any kind of computation. So if I take the headphones off, yeah, now you can see um, that uh, the software says, okay, well, the signal quality is better, but uh, we'll go on like this for now because otherwise, <laughs> The microphone is too far away. I might have to invest into a streamer microphone here if I want to show this. Um, but yeah. So this is the Intuitive XR suite um, that fetches the data coming from the from the Muse. And you can see here TP9, that's the left ear, FP1, that's uh, front left, FP2, front right, and TP10. So if I tap here, yeah, exactly. So this is FP1. This is FP1. Uh, no, th yeah, this is FP2. This is FP1. This one, yeah, well, it's, yeah, half broken anyways. <laughs> and here is, uh, is the right one, yeah. But the uh, IXR suite doesn't only cover uh, the electroencephalography, this is uh, the stop, uh, but it also has the head motion, that's a gyro. So if I move my head around, you can see that reflected in the, in the measurements here. And it also has a PPG, that's a photoplethysmography. And with that, you can see my heartbeat. So this is uh, my heart, or this is actually the blood pressure. And the blood pressure will go up and down depending on the beat. And this is, it's very easy to, to disturb that signal. You can see if I move around, the EEG is still rather like rather stable. It's, it's rather smooth, but, uh, but the PPG is very easy to disturb here um, so that it doesn't really easily cover my, my blood pressure anymore. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, this is EEG, real time EEG, and uh, that is rather okay signal. So it looks like there is nothing going on, but uh, that just means that there are no strong artifacts that you can see in the in the data, um, because uh, if uh, if if you, for example, if I now clench my teeth, you can see this is muscle activity, very strong muscle activity. If I blink a lot, that's also not muscle activity, but in this case, eye blink activity. And you don't uh, you don't necessarily want these in the in the data because then you're not measuring brain data, but you're measuring other data. And uh, then here at the right side, we have the spectral power, which uh, which is just a standard analysis of the of the different frequency bands in the EEG that. Uh, 
that are then divided into the standard five bands that, uh, that are commonly reported in the literature, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And then here there is the final focus metric and it's based on these five uh, bands here or actually on four bands, so I'm not using delta, but uh, the other four bands, I use them. And, uh, and then in the end, uh, there comes this final focus matrix. And this one is, is in the range of zero to one, and that will be then streamed to the game or any other application that makes use of, of this thing. The difference between the five bands. Um, yeah, great question. So essentially what we have here is if you look at, at, the, at the raw signal, um, that is basically an overlaying um, of different frequency bands or different activity <laughs> okay one thing after the other but yeah so um, so the frequency bands um, essentially classically um, you can say that delta is low low um, activity something like sleep uh, so if you have predominantly delta wave um, EEG then you're for, for example very tired or almost asleep um, then you have uh, theta which also can be something like like strong focus and workload but but also a sense of um, of flow which is also associated with focus again yeah um, it's a little uh, it's, it's very tricky you cannot easily map and say well um, theta is this and alpha is that um, but generally saying um, alpha is for example more rest activity so more a default of um, uh, the, the something like an idle circuitry that is going on in the background if you don't do anything then you have a high alpha power and then beta is more associated with focus and gamma as well um, although gamma is also then uh, starting to be very strongly associated with muscle activity. So if I clench my teeth, you see that the gamma power is getting very high again. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's basically the difference between the five bands. They, they represent uh, different aspects of, uh, of brain um, anatomy in some sense so different circuitry that's going on inside the brain um, leads to different uh, frequency bands oscillations of, of electric activity um, and then you can interpret them on the psychological effects like for example workload or relaxation or stress and so on and so forth um, and, but but what, what is of, also often done here is that um, people are looking more at the ratio instead of the individual frequency bands, like for example, the alpha theta ratio or the theta alpha ratio is used as a, as a, a ratio of workload. And uh, then we have the, the engagement index, which is theta divided by alpha plus beta. If I remember correctly, it's the one I use. I keep forgetting um, back and forth, but um, yeah, so, so, so I'm using that engagement index. Um, and then I divide it again by gamma because that is uh, muscle activity and I want muscle activity to lower the perceived focal focus metric. Um, yeah, and well, the muse is 90 years old. <laughs> so um, it's not 90 years old, uh, but uh, it's... Or, or, so, so, can you can you rephrase the question? Do you mean do you mean uh, EEG as uh, as a whole is ninety years old? Because then you would be uh, almost right. Um, but the Muse itself, uh, the Muse is just a very cheap device. That's why we're using it. So um, it's it it has a consumer um, consumer value already. So people are buying it for sleep detection and meditation. That's why it's, it's, it's not a bad uh, idea to use the Muse for, uh, for, for these kind of um, yeah, applications that are for gaming and so on, because there, there's a higher chance that people have one of these at home than a medical grade EEG. Um, 
but in the future I think there's going to be a shift towards uh, EEG devices that are in the in the ear um, so either really in the ear canal like like um, headphones uh, in-ear headphones um, there are some companies starting to do that or around the ear which is also actually a good uh, a good way to measure EEG it's, it's not that common in research yet but it will be I think because it uh, offers a, a pretty high usability but still a pretty decent uh, neurophysiological um, analysis options um, but at the moment I don't think there is any product um, that is on the market that I feel comfortable using instead of the Muse because I don't think there are any on the market that people just have at home. <laughs> so that's why I'm using the Muse. And also the Muse fits well under a VR because you can just like, um, put the VR like, right here and then um, and that's fine. Like, it, it, it's dry electrodes, you can easily use that. Um, yeah, but for a proper experiment, for a proper brain-computer interface experiment, you would use um, EEG that uses gel. So you put a little bit of gel um, on the electrodes and you would also use it along the entire head so that you can measure uh, more interesting brain areas. Um, there will be a device by Neurable um, in the future. I don't know when exactly they will release it. Um, which is also like in the headphones. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, they also have their own measure of uh, focus and when I tried it out it was quite quite interesting. Um, I, ha I, I, I have to uh, test it in order to say more but um, they also want to get into the market of everyday users so um, it does sound quite, uh, quite, um, quite good actually but I don't know when exactly it will come out. And Kate uh, is asking for the first band related to sleep. Why would that be included for something that requires active thought, like doing PCI? Um, you mean the delta band here? Um, it is just measured um, and and just displayed. I'm not using it in my formulas to compute um, to compute PCI uh, or the focus power, but. But since the, the standard brain waves are these five frequency bands, um, I chose to display them here because that's generally what people are expecting to see in these kind of EEG analysis. Um, but you can also see uh, that delta power is very high, not only in sleep, because I'm not sleeping right now, but you can see delta is fluctuating very strongly because it also is dependent on eye movement. So if I'm blinking a lot, then you see the lower frequency power is, uh, is very high. And that's also what's happening um, uh, if I'm moving my eyes left and right, up and down, then you also have this delta power very high. And we don't want that. Like We, we, don't, um, we don't generally want to measure eye movement if you want to use brain-computer interfaces. Um, but that's why I'm also uh, hesitant to really call it a brain-computer interface uh, from a scientific perspective. I chose to call it a brain-computer interface uh, on the Skyrim Nexus webpage because it's rather tedious to explain all the intricacies there, but um, I am more comfortable in calling it a physiological user interface. And it seems like the connection is lost. Let's see. Just turning it off and back on again. So it should be off now. And in theory, it should just uh, find itself again. Let's see. There is a console here. Well, that doesn't work quite as intended but I'll just restart it. So this shouldn't be much of a problem actually if you restart uh, the oh yeah if you restart the uh, the stream um, because for if you are using Skyrim the real virtual uh, magic mod um, then it will just continue to play so your game won't crash 
that's actually a big reason why we chose to create this IXR suite instead of having it inside the Skyrim mod as we had it in the first place. So, so in the beginning, when I when I created the first version of the mod, um, it was uh, it was all inside the Skyrim mod, and there was no external um, software like the IXR suite um, right now. But that had the significant problem that, well. If the connection was lost, as you could see uh, right now, then it would just not work <laughs> and the entire game would crash and it's uh, rather tedious. Okay, does it work now? Oh no, okay, well, I clicked on it too early. Let's try again. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so this can happen. Um, it's always a little tricky with Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth is a, is a feeble uh, thing. <laughs> it's very easily disturbed and um, it, it should definitely, um, yeah, I, I, I would opt for a different device. There are also devices that use Wi-Fi instead of Bluetooth for transitioning, but um, yeah. Um, so, um, Kate, Asked, no, no, uh, that I already answered that. Uh, Bira, um, it's all fake. <laughs> well, that depends, right? So, as I said, it's I'm hesitant to call it a, a brain computer interface right now because I want to be strict with the facts um, as a scientist. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no brain signal in there. Um, it just means that I'd rather call it a physiological user interface because it's more general. So yes, I use brain information in this, uh, in this processing and I also use eye movement uh, in the processing and there is also muscle activity that's getting uh, like fed into this final focus metric. So essentially fake um, in a way, yes, it's fake. In another way, focus. So I'm not strictly interested in, in measuring the brain, right? So the, the brain is, is just the vehicle that I chose to measure the mind and what's going on inside the mind. Now what's going on, on inside the IXR here? It's, uh, I have a Bluetooth thing here, but it seems to be a little unhappy. Um, what is involved in making this tool work with other EGs beside the news? Ah, oh, there we are going. Um, so I can actually show you the source code. Um, so. The, underlying, uh, the underlying tool that I use to create uh, or to access the EEG data is BrainFlow at the moment. Um, that's a... Um, let me show you. So BrainFlow is a library um, that supports plenty of different uh, EEG devices. Um, boards. There are really a lot of different EEG boards that are supported nowadays from BrainFlow and right now I don't support using lab streaming layer to record data for the IXR suite but I will. So, um, so that's the second library that's often used um, for measuring EEG data or other physiological data. They are basically just like LSL, left streaming layer, is the thing that uh, that's basically always used in research or in, in, in a lot of different research labs. And that is currently not implemented as an input, but it's implemented as an output. So you can actually record all the stuff uh, coming from the Muse, uh, like the raw data and also the process data. You can record that using the left streaming layer lab recorder here, um, but uh, I currently didn't have I just didn't have the time 
to add more uh, options to feed it to the ISR suite. But we have uh, like very strong plans and, and like the, the explicit goal to also make the ISR suite compatible with research grade EEG. So um, that we, we, we need that for our own experiments um, and then uh, that's basically what we will do in the, in the future updates. So essentially what's involved with that is um, if your board is part of the brain flow um, li library, then you can actually just use a different board um, and it will probably work out of the box. So I have tested it with one different uh, uh, brain flow based EEG device and that worked right away. Um, so that was not an issue. Uh, and if you want to use a, an, an LSL based EEG, then best is probably to wait until we have it implemented, unless you want to contribute. Then Bera asks, what about the one from the study where they got the music people were hearing? How do we know it comes from the brain and they aren't just picking up the sound waves from outside? Let me check. So I remember such a study. Is it the one that maybe I shared myself? Um, I remember checking the, uh, this study. Um, there was one. Oh yeah, that's the that's the from two minute papers. Um, let's actually, you know what? Let's let's uh, look at this um, thing. I will skip through it and pause it. Um, and I can tell you exactly uh, what's the key difference here. I will mute it because it will probably be annoying for you anyways. Oh, come on. I forgot that this is, let's not do that. Let's go here. Dear fellow scholars, this is two minute papers with Dr. Okay, no subtitles needed. So, um, yeah, that's uh, actually a nice, uh, <laughs> nice um, position to pause. So, they had an IEEG data set, um, which means intracranial EEG and uh, they obtained that from uh, from neurosurgical patients so um, they had people going through surgery with an open skull and yeah here here you can see what uh, intracranial EEG means so inside the open skull onto the brain um, you you lay a set of uh, of electrodes so these electrodes are not outside like what i'm doing here um, but they are on the brain uh, on the external part of the brain they are not stick um, um, there they, they are no needles sticking into the brain but they are on the outer surface of the brain and uh, and then um, that normally just happens when people are having a, a, a surgery anyways right so you wouldn't open the skull for a person just because it's interesting to do an experiment like this. Um, so normally you have a very specific subset uh, population that is uh, having some sort of surgery in the brain. Um, and then they, they are asked if they would also be willing to participate in a study like that. And uh, with, this, with these kind of electrodes, right, uh, we can be rather sure that... Um, that they are picking up mostly brain information because the electrodes are so close to the brain. And the biggest problem that we have with these kind of electrodes is that the, the electrical signal needs to go through the different, um, the different parts of the skull. And the skull is actually really, really bad because it's some sort of like, it's a sort of insulator because it has um, pores that are uh, that are filled with air or uh, or at least not with fluids and uh, that is actually a really bad um, electrical uh, uh, electrical transmitter 
So on like measuring EEG, electrical activity on the outside of the skull um, is often equated, and I think that's a really good equation, um, um, is often equated with having microphones, a bunch of different microphones at the outside of a football stadium. So if you know at which area of the football stadium you have your microphones and um, for example you know that you are on the uh, at the corner of one team and then you have a second microphone at the corner of the other team and all of a sudden you hear one microphone having much more noise than the other microphone then you can kind of think that probably one team scored a goal or there was a foul and so on and then the difference between a goal and a foul could for example be the different kind of noise like you can hear cheering or you can hear boo uh, yelling or what something like that but but that's also that's all going to be very um, very difficult to to hear from the outside with a single microphone right and that is very similar to what we are doing with EG so we have two microphones if you will here at the at the one part of the brain of the head and then we have two microphones here at the back part or if you have medical grade EG and we have 64 microphones all around um, the head and um, and then we try to infer what's happening inside the brain even though we can't really have our microphones inside the brain we just try to to figure out from the from the spatial distribution and from the frequency from the kind of sound that we are hearing or from the kind of electric uh, activity that we are measuring we try to infer what's going on inside the brain so um, measuring the sound waves from the outside using an electrical activity uh, to, to conclude uh, this uh, this question from you Bera, um, Bera Freda um, if, if you have an ele electrode that that will always measure electrical activity right so um, measuring sound is in very different frequency ranges and it measures the the air going back and forth right there's air pressure essentially that you're measuring with the, with the microphone um, and sound is normally um, heard in the range of uh, what's that 50 to to 10,000 or 20,000 kilohertz, uh, 50 hertz to 10,000 uh, hertz, something like that, which is which is far far higher than what you normally look at if you're looking at EEG data. So um, so you can't really measure sound with electrodes, even if the sound was electrical, which it isn't. Um, because you're looking at different frequencies um, in the in the measured signal, but what they did was they measured the frequency and then they they used a deep uh, neural network and tried to reconstruct the sound based on the EEG uh, or IEG information that they measured. Um, yeah, well, reading the book in their head. Um, so um, there was a, a very cool new study recently. Um, let me check that. Um, did I add it in my own paper pile yet? I think I did. Metzger here, this one. So that went through the media recently. Um, that's a very new uh, Nature paper, um, just uh, accepted uh, a few weeks back. And uh, this is a study that used also intracranial EEG. So just what I, what I um, explained a few uh, minutes ago. So they had this, um, let's, let's zoom in a little, okay. So what they what you see here is they had like this grid of electrodes that they patched onto the onto the the brain area here and then they used that to reconstruct voice and uh, words and this is particularly interesting because they used 
not the thought so it's not like the the audio of the people who thought about the words uh, but instead they imagined moving their mouth and mouth movement um, is extremely difficult like extremely intricate um, because you have all these different like jaw and uh, tongue and the, the entire face is working a lot when you form words and that is uh, what they measured here and they, they were even able to not only measure the words but to also uh, reconstruct the speech sound features so really even a different kinds of intonation um, they could uh, they could measure using that and they were able to uh, to reconstruct words um, much faster like four times faster than anything that has been done before um, and they were kind of cheating in the sense that the participant um, or the patient did not imagine the sound like if you would for example read a book and you would just read the sound aloud in your mind um, that's different from really imagining to speak and move your mouth and that's what they that's what they used in this in this study so kate is asking um, what does it mean with the different bands the sensors are picking up electrical signals would each band be like different frequencies different voltages yeah different frequencies so um, um, let me let me do something funny right now. I'm having I create a whiteboard, <laughs> a paint board. So let's look at that. So we have EEG, which is just uh, going like this, All right? This is your EEG wave, um, and this wave can be reconstructed by having one wave that is like this um oh, yeah, that's really bad imagine a second wave that is basically the same as the above wave but it doesn't have this l large thing here in the center right so this this wave that you see here or this this eg data is the same as the top one and then you have another thing that is going like this and does and and and, and like this right so and th these two together, they are this top thing. And, um, and this is actually what's measured. Like this is the thing that's, that, 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 that's measured in, in the EEG. So this stuff here, like this line, that's what's measured in the EEG. But in the brain, there are different, um, in, in different areas of the brain, there are different um, sources that create electrical signals. So then, for example, one of the sources could be this one, which is basically doing nothing but just doing its, its regular circuitry. There's nothing really going on. And then, and then you have a second source, which is also doing nothing. And then all of a sudden, activity goes up and then it goes down again. So, so this activity is basically zero all over the place, right? And then this is, this is um, the, 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 the bottom source would be, for example, the brain area for memory retrieval, which is more in the, in the upper back part of the head, very roughly speaking. I'm simplifying a lot here. Um, and then, uh, or it could be, for example, the area for rule understanding, which is more in the frontal part of the brain. And then, so, so you get a new, a new information so you look at a new and at a, at a stimulus like at, at a um, a new task that you're seeing then it go it gets uh, processed in the in the visual part of the brain which is in the back and then it gets um, it gets connected with memories that you have for example um, uh, you want to put it in context and then it gets all pushed to the front part of the brain where um, there is like this rule understanding of, oh, um, I now need to press a key on my keyboard, right? And that would, for example, lead to such a thing, like such, such an event-related potential. So for example, here you have the event, and, uh, and then this is the event-related potential, like this lower part is the event-related potential. And then we measure, we measure this kind of, um, we, we can't, we cannot directly measure the original source, right? 
um, because we don't go into the brain. We are outside of the skull. Um, and, uh, and that's why we try to reconstruct this kind of source by, um, by dissociating the different frequency bands, for example. And then we can say, well, this is a, this is a source that is more theta, um, that is more in the theta frequency range. And we don't actually want to look at sources that are in the beta or in the gamma range because that's a different source. And we also have a spatial distribution. So we have a source that's more at the front and a source that's more in the back. And that's how we can try and make sense of what we measure on the, on the surface level. Does that make sense? Does that answer your, your question? Which is a good one. It's a good question, by the way. And this is, this is not, not, not a trivial, um, trivial thing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that, uh, good eye mites. Um, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really and genuinely happy that there are people uh, there um, listening to this. Uh, so I see that there are six viewers. <laughs> um, that's great. Uh, I am doing this normally um, teaching in, in the university, right? Um, and there I am in touch with people who are interested in the subject. Otherwise, um, they wouldn't be there. Um, and it is very interesting for me to try and simplify it for an audience that isn't studying the subject or that isn't, um, I mean, I assume you're all interested in it, obviously, um, but, uh, but you're no experts, at least that's also my assumption. It could be that there are some sneaky scientists now here um, testing me <laughs> and seeing uh, if, if I speak uh, the truth, but yeah. Okay, uh, Kate, that's great. I'm happy to hear that. Um, it is a really hard problem to solve. Yeah, I did a whole PhD on that. Um, like I, I, I created a processing pipeline for in the course of years, um, uh, literally five or six years I spent on creating a, a complete pipeline, um, a complete pipeline uh, on separating brain data from other data that comes from the body, like for example, eye movements and muscle activity or heart rate. You can even measure heart rate on the brain, like on the, on the skull. If, you, if you're looking at the right, um, in, in the right way, then you can reconstruct heart rate from the, from the brain um, or not from the brain, but from the skull because it's heart rate isn't happening in the brain, but you can still measure traces of the electric activity from the heart at the skull because the heart is such a strong, um, strong activity. Actually, let me do something funny. Um, I'm thinking, where is it here? So it's still working. Okay, let me do something funny. I'm just gonna, so this is, the, this is the, the same EG, right, that you can see here that I'm normally, that I normally put on my, on my skull. And the heart is just the same kind of activity in general. So let me just put the EEG on my chest and see if I can I had it working once where I was able to really measure heart rate activity using the Muse. I had it working with the old version. Yeah, here we go. Look at that. That's my heartbeat now. It's actually a really good one. <laughs> you can see very, very clearly my heartbeats. Um, even the, 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 the T wave. So you normally, with, if you have a heartbeat, then you see like the, this very strong heartbeat. Um, that's the R wave that you can see here. Let me try. So like these very, very, very strong heartbeats that you can see here, that's the R wave. And then, um, then you have these 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 lower uh, lower waves that are directly afterwards again. That's uh, that's the T wave that coming uh, that's coming after the heart. Yeah, but um, you can see that uh, this kind of electric activity is all over the body, 
it's uh, it's not it's not only the brain but it's also on the heart and uh, it's actually not that difficult to measure it um and it's also very cool <laughs> i even after all that year uh, after all those years i still find it interesting to to see this like this is my heart and i can see it on the screen and you can do it so now too <laughs> So that was a little um, excursion. Um, so as you can see, I am like in general, I, I'm a neuroscientist by trade, uh, but I'm very interested in measuring the whole body, right? So um, that's also why I don't consider it cheating to use things like um, other activity, um, because essentially what I'm interested in is not the brain. I'm interested in what's happening in the mind. And uh, if I can use the eye movements or heart rate activity or, or other things um, for that, for measuring that, then it's fine. I, I'm happy to do that. If, if I can measure focus by, by using heart rate, then that's great. Uh, why, why, why not using it then? <laughs> yeah, uh, you wish you, had, you could have your heart rate embedded into your eyesight 24 hours a day. Well, I'm not kidding, but I can see this happening in VR, right? Obviously, you are not wearing a VR glasses um, 24 hours a day at the moment. Um, let me put that back on. All right. Um, back to my brain VR. Good. So, um, uh, where was I? I completely lost track of what I wanted to say. Oh yeah, the heart rate embedded into the eyesight, right? So, um, if you're if you're thinking about the future of of uh, this uh, intuitive. XR technology. At some point, you might be just regularly using XR devices um, because, or, or like AR devices, because they are just replacing computer monitors. Maybe in the future, in ten years, fifteen years, whatever. Um, and then it's very easy to do that because you already, as you can see, it's very easy to measure these things. Like you, you can have it on your arm, you can have it on your chest. Um, and these devices are extremely cheap. There is also uh, like this polar band um, sports uh, chest strap. It's, it's like it costs 70 euros or something like that. And it gives you the same kind of heart rate activity um, that, you can, that you can get like using this device. Or, or essentially, it's not giving you the same level of accuracy as if you're using a medical grade heart rate device. But you can still see your heartbeat. You can still see the individual beats if you're using this 80 euro sports device. And, um, and that is, uh, that's going to happen. I'm pretty sure that we are currently, like we are on the transition, in the transition phase um, into an age of um, ubiquitous spatial computing, like VR devices, AR devices, the new Apple thing and so on and so forth but also ubiquitous physiological data access. So we will live in 10 years or 15 years, we will live with knowing how our bodies are working at all times. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen at some point. And I'm striving to, to make it uh, worth your while by using this, this uh, information and just um, making cool games or, or like cool other applications with it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so all these signals get picked by EEG near the brain and they essentially need to be filtered out so only to pick up brain waves. Yes, that's exactly what's happening. I can show you something else that I, um, that I did in my PhD. Um, let me show you uh, my own paper. This one, that one. Um, 21, this one. So I must, I must make very clear here that I'm not a um, 
a mathematician or software developer um, who creates the original algorithms for this. But I investigated different parameters, those parameters that are making it uh, the most effective to use these different um, algorithms. And uh, one thing we did here is uh, it's a very uh, it's a very cool study actually um, that is published somewhere else. Um, but we use the same data where people are either using virtual reality or they were using a joystick to stand in a, such a virtual environment as you can see it here and they rotate it on the spot. It's extremely boring to do, <laughs> but um, it gave us the option to measure what's happening in the brain when you rotate yourself because you always have a feeling of like where is the front direction even if, like, if you close your eyes and you stand up and you close your eyes and you rotate to the right and you rotate back you kind of know where the front was, right? And we wanted to know um, how, what happens in the brain while you rotate around. But anyways, we did that once with the joystick and once with the virtual reality headset. So we could compare the stationary and the mobile version there. And we used a very high density electrodes. Uh, so we had 128 electrodes on the head, on the scalp. And we also had a neck band in addition, so another 28 electrodes that were worn around the, around the neck. Um, and then we could subsample that and really see, okay, what is the different, um, the impact of these different numbers of electrodes and the impact of the mobility uh, on, the, on the data. Um, and the reason why I wanted, what I wanted to show you here is this one. Um, so um, if you look at the spatial distribution, so what we're doing um, is we, we have an algorithm that's not mine. Um, it's called independent component analysis, which kind of separates these 128 channels into 128 simulated channels or simulated sources. So it is as if you imagine back with this, um, with the, the football stadium, right? So if you imagine you have 100 microphones around the football stadium and you find a mathematical mixing of the sound so that instead of just listening to the individual microphones, you can kind of reconstruct what it would sound like if you had a microphone in the inside. Just using the spatial distribution of all microphones around you can simulate what it would be like if you had a microphone in the center of the stadium. And then you have a microphone at the left and at the right and so on and so forth. And that's what, what this algorithm is doing. Um, and, uh, and that gives you this kind of spatial distribution. So, and you can very clearly see um, if you look at this spatial, spatial uh, mixing um, or unmixing, you can often very clearly see whether the, the, the simulated source is coming from the brain or from not brain. So the brain is normally something like this, where you have like a more a smooth uh, transition from like the inside, um, like from like the red patch um, to the blue patch around it. So it's like a, a smooth dipole that goes from the inside of the brain to the outside. And then you have like a, a large field um, at the outside. And then you have the eyes, which are obviously right at the front and very strong and only at the front. And here you have muscle activity, which is very strong and only at the outside. So you don't see the blue smooth um, inside, but you have a, a, the muscle, muscle uh, um, tissue is outside of the skull. So the signal is extremely strong in comparison to anything coming from the inside of the skull. And it's also very localized because it doesn't get spread through the through the skull and the fluids and the brain tissue it's it's already there like you have a, a muscle here at the outside and you have an electrode at the outside then the electrode will very directly pick up the muscle activity and uh, and that's how you can see this right? and um, and we then I'm, I'm going to spare you the details in this case because it's rather boring technical stuff but we found different filters that were that we that you should use if you want to uh, analyze um, stationary data than if you want to analyze mobile data. And that's very important because the stationary filters or the filters for stationary data, those were the, those that are people using uh, normally. 
And if you apply them, this, this normal filter for the mobile data, it's not horrible, but you could do better. And, uh, and that's basically what the whole paper is about, like how to squeeze as much signal out of the raw data as you can um, with, the, with the crappy mobile data that we have. <laughs> So you would need an accurate map of the skull and where the sensors are to take into account the delay in the same signal arriving at each electrode at a different time. Um, that's great. Actually, really, really completely hit the nail on the head. That's perfectly true. Uh, we have, um, even in this case, we have individual electrode locations. So you measure for every participant, if you want to go extremely um, into high details, you put them in a scanner first. So that you measure the, the, the physical um, presence of the brain, like how, uh, how is it shaped in, in this participant. And then you measure the, the exact position of all electrodes outside of the skull when you uh, collect the EEG. And then you model um, the electrical activity that is spreading through the brain to the, to the outside of the skull. And that is how you can then inverse that. Like, so you model the spread from inside to outside, and then you inverse that, and then you have the outside topography, like, like this, uh, this kind of uh, brain thing here. And then you model that how exactly, where exactly would that come from? Um, I don't think I have one here, but that's called the dipole. Um, uh, dipole localization, dip, fat, eg, line. let me show you this. Do we have that? Yeah, so so if you look at this, so in the, le in the, in the to the left, you can see this is like uh, what it looks like if you have different topographies, as I already told you. And then here, this is what it looks like if you, if you trace back the simulated electrical activity into the brain. And you can say, well, there are some dipoles that are here. Um, they look like, uh, let me show you something else. For example, in, um, there's one. In this paper, we were then looking at a very specific, um, very specific brain area called the retrosplenial complex, um, which is here, the, the orange, uh, no, the, the red cluster that you can see here. So this is a brain. Um, if you slice my head here, um, that is the, the left image that you can see here. These are the eyes and, uh, and that's, uh, that's the front that's here. And that's the back of the head that's here that's what we were looking at the most and then if you slice it here um, that would be this plot and if you slice it uh, here <laughs> uh, that's the rightmost plot and so so we can try and uh, visualize uh, where these these activity come from and we were looking at a very specific uh, brain region and uh, and for that we need this kind of source reconstruction because otherwise you can only look at the data at the activity on the skull um, but that's, that is not an imaging um, method. So we wanted to really image what's happening inside the brain instead of using sensor level surface uh, analysis here. Um, but there's one thing I need to say, um, Kate, um, the, there's no delay um, in, the, in the signal. So that you can basically assume that it's instantaneous because electrical activity is traveling almost at light speed. Um, it's not completely at light speed, but it doesn't make any relevant difference uh, for, for our measurements. Um, so, uh, so we don't actually have a time delay, but we just have a spatial distribution. So if you have a, um, a dipole, like, um, like here, like if you have a dipole from here, like this, if, if we look at this, this uh, particular dipole there, um, it will just spread to the front and to the back. And this is, for example, one, um, or it's a dual dipole. Um, that's a bit of a tricky example here. Um, yeah, this one, for example, that's a single dipole, 
Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's at, uh, at the front center and it's pointing right upwards. Um, and this dipole will look something like No, I don't have it. Yeah, something like the inverse of that. So, so this this red blob would be here at the front, and the uh, the back part would be blue. Um, but so so that's uh, th that's the point. We don't we don't have a time wise delay, but we have a spatial smearing of the signal. And in order to reconstruct the original source, uh, yes, we need the very accurate uh, sensor locations. And the idea is to filter out noise or background frequencies. Um, yeah, uh, another very good point. So, so that depends. <laughs> so you can filter out noise. For example, that would be my other paper. Um, just casually um, showing you all my work here. Um, So uh, this is an algorithm that's again not made by me. I just made um, the, the, the improvement and the usability around it so that it works fully automatically. Um, that's an algorithm that uh, filters out line noise. So you have this 50 hertz or in the States you have 60 hertz uh, line noise, power line noise that's just always around, around, uh, surrounding us because it's just the way our power line works. And um, and if we if we look at that, so if we zoom in here a little bit, so um, so that is if you look at a, a, an EEG, so you have these kind of peaks, the frequencies here, like a different like a regular EEG does not have that. A regular EEG looks like this, like the, the clean spectrum here at the bottom. Um, you have a little kind of of, of bumps. Um, but you don't have these very strong uh, frequency specific sharp um, peaks. And uh, that is something that you want to remove because it's most likely an electrical noise. So that has nothing to do with the body. It has, um, it has most likely to do with the devices that you're using. For example, um, uh, this one, that's a virtual reality uh, peak. So that's a 90 Hertz peak. Um, if you wear a virtual reality device, then you will have a peak in the signal at 90 hertz because that's a very specific, that's the refresh rate of the display. Um, actually, by looking at our data, I could see that the HTC Vive does not have a refresh rate of 90 hertz, but of 85, uh, 89.5 hertz. So it's a little less than 90 hertz. Just a fun fact uh, for you to know. <laughs> um, I could see that in the data, in our electrical data that we get there. Um, and that you want to remove completely. Yeah, scammed, exactly. I was almost uh, writing a, a, a hate mail. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we have that. Um, and this, this, this peak frequencies in this kind of like technical artifacts, uh, line noise or other devices like virtual reality and so on, you just want to, you want to remove that completely. It has nothing to do with anything you want to analyze. You, you wish that it's not at all there, right? <laughs> um, and uh, and that's uh, that's what you're aiming for in this kind of using this kind of algorithm, for example, right? So 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 you try to remove the technical filters, or you, you try to remove the technical artifacts. Uh, you have other kinds of artifacts that are that happens when you move the electrodes on your head. Um, for example, if I touch the electrode and I just move around the electrode on the skin. That's a very strong artifact. Right? This also has nothing to do with what's going on in my brain. So this is another technical artifact in some sense. It's not from coming from a device, but it's coming from the, the shift of um, the connection between the electrode and the skull or, or the skin. So uh, ideally, these two would be completely gone. And that actually, this one, that's the biggest problem with dry electrodes because that's normally, that is the thing that we try to remove or try to, to improve if we are using gel-based EEG. So normally you have these very fancy caps that you're wearing and then you put gel in with a syringe that's like very sticky and annoying. <laughs> um, 
and that's uh, that just that's just there to improve this connection between the electrode and um, and the skin and that's especially important obviously if you have a uh, if you have if you want to electro if you want to record on the head where there is hair so you need to like pierce through the hair to get on the skin um, uh, but this is the biggest issue in mobile uh, dry EEG so because if you're using a VR and you have this um, this um, electrode integrated into the VR which is also what for example happened um, in the uh, in the Galia, the OpenBCI Galia device, uh, they have it integrated into the VR faceplate. And if you move around, the, the VR will always shift a lot. So the, the, these kind of artifacts, these kind of shifting artifacts, they are extremely strong uh, in the Galia, unfortunately. Um, so, so there's lots of room for improvement. Um, yeah, saline is one solution, saline electrodes, um, there are a bunch of uh, hardware uh, manufacturers doing that, um, like the Emotive Epoch, um, which Perry um, is using in her devices, um, the, um, that, that is better, uh, but it's also annoying. So you still have to clean it, you have to make sure that there's no mold coming and like destroying your, your devices and so on. So. Um, but it's like an intermediate solution. Everyone can do it and saline solution with a sponge um, is easy to apply and it's not completely uh, yucky in the end. You don't need to wash your hair with all this gel. Like if you're doing an EEG experiment, it's very cool. It's a cool experience. But no matter how often you wash your hair, you will still get some gel. The minute you dry your hair and you're like, you think like you're done, um, you will still feel like there's some gel on your on your head. <laughs> it's very annoying. So yeah, so this is um, this is the background frequency, or th this kind of th that's a technical artifact, right? We have these shifts, and we have the electrical activity that we want to remove, um, and then we have artifacts that come like from the heart, or from the muscles, or from the eyes. Those are also normally um, treated as artifacts in the sense that people try to remove them although I am tempted to call them signals from a different source because they are from the body right you you can still interpret those signals if you're if you're doing it the right way they can still give you some information so so we are back at this uh, thing of it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> if, you, if you do it the right way, you can still use it. Um, but it's also commonly uh, tried to remove. Um, yeah. And there is something else uh, to, be, to be told about background noise or background frequencies. The brain has something like a background activity that you can also see here. So generally, you have this thing of you have more activity at lower frequencies and then ever less activity at higher frequencies. That's called the 1 over F background. And people are not quite sure what it means. There are some studies that have found that it has to do with flexibility. So um, a cognitive flexibility, how, how fast can you react and so on um, but th that's also so so background is not only noise even in the brain even if you stick electrodes into the brain there is some sort of background thing going on and people are not entirely sure how to interpret that background um, but it has a meaning it's not just uh, it changes throughout the day it changes throughout your life um, um, like if you have older adults, uh, compare them to younger adults, uh, you can see a different in the background activity and so on. So uh, it's very interesting what's going on there with this, uh, with this kind of research. So it's not all noise that you try to remove. Ideally, you would keep everything, but not remove it, but just have it separate. So then you can interpret everything at the same time. So um, Shannon's law, yeah, um, interference, yeah. So you're curious how um, they're taking into account all these sources of noise 
to reliably reconstruct a signal from each individual device. Yeah, actually, I have no idea. Um, this uh, uh, this telecommunication thing. I've also um, spoken to an audio scientist once, uh, and they were doing something very similar to what what I'm doing, um, and. I'm not quite sure if we are not maybe reinventing the wheel here <laughs> because these different fields are not speaking much um, to each other. Maybe there are people already doing something very similar to what we are doing and we're just doing the same thing all over again, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite uh, horrible to think of. <laughs> um, but it's very difficult, uh, very difficult uh, to get everyone connected uh, for these kind of things because every scientist uh, is looking at the next paper to publish and it doesn't have time really. Uh, too many variables, yes indeed. Uh, if you think about it, uh, we have literally millions of sources that, we gener that are generating signals or billions um, of sources that are generating signals and then we have four electrodes using the Muse, or we have 128 electrodes using uh, using medical grade EEG or like this research grade EEG. Um, it's uh, it's um, it, it, there are too many variables, and that's a big problem. <laughs> um, and then you always have to try and find a heuristic. That's why this kind of decomposing the original signal into its sources is always wrong essentially it's always wrong it's just a qu question of um, can you tweak it such that it is useful um, to interpret the, the signal in the end and uh, yeah okay no nothing to be sorry about this is a, it's a good point uh, it's, uh, this is uh, it's great actually I must say um, all the questions that have been asked today here and the comments are, are good questions and good comments. Um, uh, it's it's great to see that uh, that the, the the main concepts um, are. It's it's so it's it's not magic what we're doing here, right? Um, it's not it's not crazy that uh, yes, if you want to create the algorithms yourself, right? Um, um, then you would have to study for a while and do, be a mathematician or whatever. Um, but the stuff that we are doing essentially is not that. Oof, what was that? The stuff that we are doing is, is essentially not that crazy or, or black magic thing, right? Um, you can definitely, like your intuition, with all your ideas here that you asked, the questions that you asked, and your uh, and the comments that you made is it's quite it's quite good. Yeah? You, you, um, it's it's something that you can still contribute even if you haven't studied it uh, or something like that. It's it's. Uh, um, it's understandable. It's, it's not crazy. <laughs> so I've been rambling now almost for for one and a half hours. Um, I'm thinking I should maybe show you at the very end um, in case you ever use this. Um, just very very briefly. Um, you can also go to here we are to the lab streaming layer github repository so just github.com slash lab streaming layer in one word and you find the lab recorder or you just google lsl lab recorder um, so this and i think there's also a link on my discord anyways um, so using this uh, you just download the latest release um, as, as always um, just download the one that works for your operating system and then you have you have this uh, lab recorder here. That's what you downloaded and then you can open that and it will also probably tell you that it's an insecure source if you do it the first time. And that's what you see here in the end. Um, um, using the lab recorder, you can see all the different data streams that are created from the Muse. So, uh, so we have the EEG data, that's, that's these four lines, we have the PPG data, that's the bottom three lines, in this case the third channel is empty, and we have, uh, we have the gyro data, that's these three lines here, and we have a log that 
if you want to have a log file, you don't need that necessarily. You have an LSL relay, you can disregard that. Um, and here you have the spectral power. That is actually the these frequency bands, right? That's uh, this. Oh, the other way. This one. So the spectral power. Um, this uh, this channel is actually these frequency bands um, that you can that that you can also record. Um, and then there's the brain power in the end. That this is the final focus metric that uh, that would go in your game or whatever. Um, and you can just easily record that, and you get an XDF file that you can. Um, open using MATLAB, using EEG lab, uh, depending on what you want to do. And that is also, um, if you ever happen to participate in a study, um, using this uh, Muse yourself, you're playing one of, my, uh, one of my applications there, and you want to share your data, that's also what you have to do. So that's also what I'm asking um, a few participants, uh, or like a few of, of our testers at the moment, uh, to provide uh, their data in this using this format. So this is also what we are using in our everyday research. So that is that is the the real software that we are using in our in our scientific research. Just so you know. Ready for your day? Oh yeah, for me it's ready for dinner. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's great, uh, Kate. Uh, software engineer with a curiosity into the brain, that's fantastic. That's exactly the target audience uh, of what I'm doing here. Not only that, but also gamers and everyone. Uh, just, uh, I'm really, really happy um, to have, to have uh, everyone here. Um, and uh, I'm not entirely sure how many viewers there are right now. I have four viewers, so, so that's, that's fine. That's good. Um, I, I will continue to do that. Um, and you can collect questions if you have any. You can also share papers. You can, like, if, if you have a paper um, that you found or if you have an article or maybe a, um, a YouTube win a video that you saw or some comment or whatever, anything that you find curious uh, and you want to share it with me here in the chat, you can do that. Next time I'm online, just uh, throw it into the chat and I will open it um, and then we can discuss it. Um, that's That's... It's really like this, this kind of uh, Q&A session here is, is made for people um, to just ask questions and kind of demystify this kind of science so that you can, you can, feel, the, um, you can feel more secure in, or, uh, yeah, secure in using these devices at some point in the future. So anything you want to throw my way, I'll try and do my best to explain it. Um, and I will also tell you when I don't know it. <laughs> MATLAB was difficult to use. Well, um, I basically lived in MATLAB. Uh, so I, five years I, I had MATLAB open basically 24-7. So I was also teaching a MATLAB programming course. So anything you want to ask there. I actually have a MATLAB teaching. Um, uh, it's, it's publicly available. So um, if you ever want to to learn uh, MATLAB, you can go to my GitHub. And there is a repository that I was using for my uh, students, older image, huh? anyways, um, data science, this one. Um, it's just uh, assignments, code, and even slides. Everything online uh, for my for my uh, class that I taught in Berlin um, for for my students. Um, I, I don't have the the answers <laughs> on obviously uh, for obvious reasons. I don't have the answers up here um, on the on the repository. But uh, but you can do all the you can look at all the slides um, for I think it was twelve or something like introduction um uh, what kind of like coding principles uh, uh and even in the end some machine learning principles uh, clustering dimensionality reduction classification stuff like that it's all open source and uh just you j just download it and uh, uh, if you have any questions um throw them my way cool 
Um, that was great. Thank you so much for asking questions. Without questions in this stream chat, um, I would have stopped for after a few minutes <laughs> because I don't like uh, I don't know what's happening. Um, so I'm really really happy um, that you were asking questions and uh, interacting here. Um, that's great. It's a lot of fun uh, to do that, and I hope uh, you got something out of it too, and it wasn't too boring. And I look forward to do that again. And I think with that, I will call it a day and uh, wish you a great start in the day or uh, start in the evening or wherever you are at the moment. Also, let me know if you prefer a different time of day um, and, and or a different day in the week. Um, but uh, I'm still flexible um, in, in adapting to uh, to the audience uh, because uh, because it's everything is new here right <laughs> thank you and uh, have a beautiful and lovely day bye